So I hope you're learning to think your way through this part of the book of Acts and you're taking note and remembering the big events, the judgment on Ananias and Sapphira in the council of Gamaliel in chapter 5, the choosing of the first deacons, we're calling them deacons in chapter 6, the sermon and martyrdom of Stephen in chapter 7, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch by Philip in chapter 8, and also the opening of the ministry to Samaria. If you ask the question, what is the most important chapter in the book of Acts? Probably the answer would be chapter 2, the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But a very, very close second would be chapter 9, the conversion of, the, of Saul of Tarsus, the most consequential conversion in the history of Christianity. And you know, if we study chapter 8, um, we can learn a lot about evangelism. We can see how Philip obeyed and how he responded and how he approached and how he used Scripture first one place in Scripture and then lots of Scripture, and how he listened and how he, he uh, was alert and sensitive to what the man needed, and he came close to the man to speak to him in Christ. We can draw lots and lots and lots and lots of less, lessons in evangelism. But in chapter 9, there's no human methodology which leads to the conversion of the Apostle Paul. God does it by Himself. Jesus does it alone. I was a pastor in North Carolina in my 20s and 30s, and there was a, a housing estate across the street from our church. And I and a few others from our church, we knocked on every door of that housing estate, and we tried to tell people about Christ. And one day, after nothing happened for two or three years, one day a man came to our church and he said that he lived across the street and he had become a Christian. And I said, who from our church visited you? He said, nobody. I saw my first child being born and I said, there has to be a God. And I got a Bible and I opened the Bible and I read it and I believed it and I've become a Christian. That man later became the chairman of the board of deacons in that church. But nobody from our church did it. We tried, but we failed. We didn't find him and we didn't reach him. The first time I went to Iraq, 14 of us um, sat in a group. Actually, there were 11 of us sitting in a group. And eight of the 11 were Muslim background believers. And we ran, we ran around the circle and we told everybody how we came to believe in Christ. I thought that these Muslims would say they came to Christ because somebody like me came in there and led them to Christ. Not one of them said that. Not one of them. All of them were led to Christ directly by the Lord. It was an amazing thing for me. It shocked me. I couldn't believe it. That was 2005 when that happened. Well, an, an, another show. We only know three things about Saul so far. He's been mentioned three times. And each time, he's been mentioned as a violent persecutor of the church. And in the beginning of chapter 9, we see him doing the same thing. He's threatening. He's threatening to murder the disciples of the Lord. And Saul is a missionary. He's not content to do it in Jerusalem. He wants to go other places to persecute Christians. He doesn't just want to persecute Christians in the place where he lives. He wants to persecute Christians in Damascus. So he goes to get official permission from the chief priest to go to Damascus to bring Christians back to Jerusalem to punish them. And so he travels to Damascus with this purpose. And in verse 3, it says that he saw a great light. 
it was like a flash of lightning. And he falls to the ground, and after seeing a great light, he hears a great voice, and the voice calls his name, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I don't know if you remember this from your study of the Gospel of John or from your other studies, but you know what? Jesus never asks a question to learn. Jesus never asks a question because he doesn't know the answer. Jesus always knows the answer to the question before he asks it. He's like a teacher in a kindergarten. A kindergarten teacher asks lots of questions but she knows the answer to all of them. Jesus doesn't ask a question to learn. Jesus asks a question to teach. And he says, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And here we have the, the seed of the idea of the church as the body of Christ. What Jesus was saying was, when you hurt them, you hurt me. When you persecute them, you persecute me. Paul was the only New Testament writer who spoke of the church as the body of Christ. Peter doesn't do it. James doesn't do it. John doesn't do it. Luke doesn't do it. Only Paul. And it may be the first lesson he ever learned when he heard the voice speak from heaven. We must account for the conversion of a great persecutor. How did this happen? Why did it happen? Well, it happened because Christ appeared to him. Saul falls down on the ground and he says in verse 5, Who are you? And the answer comes in the same verse, I am Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. Now, um, it says in verse 7 that the men who were traveling with him heard the voice but couldn't see anything. Later, in subsequent testimonies, it says that they didn't hear. Actually, when we look at the Greek words that are used, they heard something but they didn't understand it. So when it says later that they didn't hear it, they didn't hear it with understanding. They didn't hear intelligible speech. They only heard a noise. So Saul gets up and he goes into the city and he's blind. This is one of the very, very few negative miracles in the New Testament. You know, Christ only worked one negative miracle during his earthly ministry. Do you remember what it was? Anybody remember what it was? Which negative miracle did Christ work? He cursed the fig tree. Remember? That's the only negative show of his power that we have in the New Testament. Well, this is a negative miracle. Saul is struck blind and he has to be led by the hand. He couldn't see for three days and he didn't eat or drink for three days. Most of the fasts in the New Testament are a fast from food. Jesus fasts in the wilderness. Matthew chapter 4 is a fast from food. For three days, Saul goes on an absolute fast, no food and nothing to drink. That's hard. And there was someone in Damascus called Ananias, and the Lord spoke to Ananias and told him to go help Saul of Tarsus. Now, Ananias does what anybody would do. He, he says in verse 13, Lord, I don't think you understand. Now, that's a funny thing to say to Christ, isn't it? I don't think you understand. This is a bad guy. He kills people like me. It would be like um, the Lord telling a missionary to go find Osama bin Laden and witness to him as an American missionary. Well, that's not a real smart idea because you're probably going to get killed. Well, that's how Ananias felt. But it was through the hands of Ananias, it was through the hands of a Christian whom Saul had come to persecute that Saul would receive his sight back. 
But first, Jesus has to convince Ananias. Now look at what Jesus says about Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, in verse 15. Ananias says, please don't make me go. I don't want to go. Jesus says, you are going to go because he is my chosen instrument to bear my name before the Gentiles as well as the sons of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. Two or three things. Spiritual greatness is usually connected to suffering. A person very rarely becomes spiritually great without great suffering. There was a Canadian teacher called Tozer. Tozer said it is doubtful whether God has used anyone greatly before he hurts them deeply. And Jesus says, here's what I'm going to show him. I'm going to show him what great things he's going to do for me. I'm going to show him that he's going to write the New Testament. I'm going to show him that the biggest cathedral in London is going to be named after him. I'm going to show him that people are going to name their sons after him. Is that what he says? No, he doesn't say that. He says, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for me. And you know, suffering can only be explained by God Himself. I can't explain your suffering to you. Only God can explain it. Only God could explain Job's suffering to him. His friends couldn't explain it. There's been staying at my house recently a family, a little boy with a brain injury. He has cerebral palsy. The child was perfectly healthy. The doctor who delivered him in, London, in England did a bad job and damaged his brain. The little boy can't walk, the little boy can't talk, and he can't control his arms. He wants to walk, he wants to talk, but he can't because his brain was injured by the doctor. I pray for that little boy by name every day. I can't make it okay with his mother and father. I can't make it okay with him. I don't have that power. I don't have that wisdom. But the Lord can. The Lord can make it okay. The Lord can make suffering bearable and understandable and purposeful. Suffering is the great test. Our commitment to Christ is theoretical until we suffer. It's like a, a soldier being trained for battle. We don't know whether we'll be brave or whether we'll run in battle. We won't know until somebody's shooting at us. Then we'll know. And so what Jesus says is, I'm going to show him, I'm going to explain to him, how much he must suffer for me. So Ananias goes, and the first thing he says to him, well, he lays his hands on him, and he says, Brother Saul. He treats him like a converted man. And he told him what Jesus said. And Saul regained his sight, and he got up, and he was baptized. And then he was with the disciples. Now, Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee, and Saul of Tarsus was a student of Gamaliel, who was a member of the Sanhedrin, who spoke to the Sanhedrin at the end of Acts chapter 5. First, the Jewish leaders put Peter in prison, and then they discover that he's out of prison, even though the doors are still locked. Now they send Saul of Tarsus to Damascus to persecute Christians, and then they discover that he's become a Christian. Can you imagine? But that doesn't convert them. Now they'll only decide that they're going to kill Saul, whose Roman name is Paul. But this is where it happens. He goes into the synagogue immediately, proclaiming 
the most offensive thing about Christianity to the Jews, the most offensive thing about Christianity to the Muslims. He is the Son of God. He started in the hardest place. The world doesn't mind Jesus as long as he's just a good teacher. The world doesn't mind Jesus as just, just as long as he's a great example or a great martyr or a model of love and forgiveness. The world doesn't mind that at all. They will accept a Jesus like that. But Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the only Savior who must die for sinners, Jesus that we proclaim, God's only Son and Earth's only Savior, uh-uh, the world will not accept that. And so Saul begins at the hardest place as he preaches the gospel of Christ in the synagogue. And so they ask themselves the question, isn't he the one who was trying to destroy Christianity? And now he's trying to support Christianity? You see, this is a picture of true repentance. This is a picture of a true turning. This is conversion. This is a radical difference. Some of you grew up in Christian homes. Some of you didn't have the opportunity to be that bad. When you became a Christian, there wasn't a big difference. Let me tell you something. When I became a Christian, there was a big difference. A big big difference in my life, night and day. And there's a big difference in the life of Saul of Tarsus. Verse 22 says that he kept increasing in strength and he kept confusing the Jews by proving that Jesus was the Messiah, by proving it from Holy Scripture. And you know what? It can be proven. It can be proven beyond any reasonable doubt. The only thing that can res resist the proof is dogmatic prejudice. And he was proving to them the identity of Jesus. And so, verse 23, they decided to do what they always do, to beat him in debate, to prove that he was wrong, to bring powerful arguments against him. No, to kill him. They decided to kill him. That's their answer to everything. That's the Muslim answer. Kill him. Don't contend for the truth. Just kill him. You know, we ought not to be afraid of people who preach a different gospel. We don't need to try to shut them up. We can listen to their arguments. Let's get their arguments out into the open and see how well their arguments compete with the Christian gospel. We don't need to try to stop them. We certainly don't need to try to hurt them. Christianity gives an opportunity for opposition. It's Christianity, it's Christian principles which say, let the Jew build his synagogue, let the Muslim build his mosque, let the atheist publish his book. Christianity can compete in a marketplace of ideas. A person who's run out of answers, a person who's insecure, a person who's pretty sure he can't prove that he's not wrong says, kill him. Kill him. And that's what they said. And the same kind of thing is still going on today. But Saul finds out about their uh, plan and he's watching. And so, in verse 25, he gets out of Damascus by being let down in a basket. He must have been a small man. Tradition says that he was a small man. And as a matter of fact, he talks about this in 2 Corinthians 12. In 2 Corinthians, the, the Corinthians had a problem with Paul. The Corinthians were steeped in Hellenism, that is, they were steeped in Greek culture and philosophy. And in Greek culture and philosophy, there was the model of a hero. There was a model of a speaker. And when Paul preached in Corinth, he did not keep the rules of Greek rhetoric. And so they said, he's a lousy speaker. 
I don't think that means he was a boring teacher. I think all it means is that he didn't keep the rules of Greek rhetoric. So they, direct, so they rejected him. Who was the greatest hero of Hellenism? Well, it was the founder of Hellenism, Alexander the Greek. And here's an amazing thing. Alexander the Greek conquered Damascus. And he conquered Damascus by personally going over the wall. In 2 Corinthians, when Paul is answering the Corinthians, he's saying, you know, you're right. I'm not a hero. I'm not the person that you want. I'm not a hero according to Hellenism. I'm not a hero according to Greek ideas of a hero. I'm not an Alexander. Alexander came over the wall to get in. Hey, I was let down the wall to get out in a basket trying to get away. You see, he's playing with them a little bit. He's teasing them a little bit. when He's, he's being ironic when he's talking to them. So the first thing that happens is that he has to run away. By the way, um, sometimes we have to face danger and sometimes we have to die. Sometimes we have to prove our commitment to Christ by coming out into the open and letting others kill us. Of course, we only get to do it once. But sometimes that's God's will. But that's not God's will every time. As a matter of fact, if you look back in Matthew chapter 10, um, when Jesus is sending the 70 out, he actually tells them, um, this is Matthew 10, 23. He says, if they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. He doesn't say, if they're trying to hurt you, you need to come out into the open and let them kill you. He actually says, run away. Sometimes it is God's will to run away from people who are trying to hurt us. And that's what happens in Damascus. Now, later, later, Paul will run toward the people who are trying to hurt him in Jerusalem. They try to get him not to go, but he says, no, I'm going. So sometimes we run away from the people who are trying to hurt us. Sometimes we run straight at the people who are trying to hurt us. How do we know? The Lord will show us. If we're willing to be hurt for the sake of the gospel, the Lord will show us when we risk being hurt and when we take self-protective measures, evasive measures, and we try to get away. Early in his ministry, he ran away. He was let down the wall in a basket. Later, he ran straight at his persecutors, and eventually he was killed for his faith. Here he's let down in a basket, Acts chapter 9, verse 25. Then he comes to Jerusalem, and he tries to join the Christian community, but he shows up at church, and they call off church. He walks into a Christian meeting, and the place empties because they're afraid of him. They, they don't believe it. They don't believe it's, he's really converted. They believe it's a trap, that it's a trick. And so it says that when he, he was trying to associate with the disciples and they were all afraid of him, they didn't believe that he was a true Christian. They didn't believe he was really converted. But now this man Barnabas shows up again. Remember, we haven't seen him in a long time. The last place we saw him was Acts chapter 4, end of Acts chapter 4. He was the one who was giving all his property away to the Jerusalem church. And this man is the first Christian in Jerusalem to believe that Saul has really been converted. He's really been changed. He's really a Christian. The first time, well, the only time I ever visited Estonia was right at the end of the Soviet period. 
and I taught in several churches in Tallinn, the capital. And a leader, in a, and I was given a, an interpreter. And the leader of the Methodist church there said, he works for the security forces. He's not really a Christian. And later I found out that that was true. That my interpreter, who was translating for me, was not a Christian at all. Um, well, time will tell who the real Christians are. But in the beginning, they didn't think that Saul of Tarsus had really been converted. And it was Barnabas, Barnabas whose name means son of encouragement. Barnabas says he's really in. He's really one of ours. He's been speaking out boldly in the name of Jesus. And they're, they're actually trying to kill him now. So we need to believe that this has really happened. So they bring him down to Caesarea and they send him away to his hometown, to Tarsus, verse 30. Verse 31 is something beautiful. The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. TVS is a perfect way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support our educational and outreach ministry today. We exist solely upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvseminary.com. Now, the scene is going to shift from Saul of Tarsus back to Peter. This is going to happen. We're going to stay with Peter through chapter 10. And then gradually, by the time we get chapter 12, we're going to virtually say goodbye to Peter. And the focus is going to shift to Saul of Tarsus, who's called Paul, his Rome, by his Roman name, Paul. But now, after this dramatic conversion of, of Paul, um, the shift focuses, the, the focus shifts to Peter. Um, by the way, I don't know if you've ever seen a dramatic, unlikely conversion. When I came to Christ, my college roommate was um, somebody very, 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 very far from the Lord. And I became a Christian during the summer. And I was going, and I had one more year of university. And I knew that I was going to return to the university and that my friendship with my roommate, which was a deep friendship, was going to end because he would not be able to handle the fact that I was a Christian because the things that we did together, the things that we had fun doing, were all based on very non-Christian attitudes. So I was dreading this. I thought, well, you know, I'm going to follow Christ, but it's going to be hard to lose all those friends. He called me two weeks before our classes started and asked if he could come talk to me. And I said, sure. So he drove to my house in Georgia. He lived in South Carolina and told me that he was so empty and he saw no meaning in his life and he was completely depressed and he didn't know if there were any answers. Could I help him? I said, I think I can. And he came to Christ too. Now that's not as dramatic as the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, but it was a great shock to me to see what God did so quickly with one of my closest friends after I became a Christian. The greatest thing I dreaded when I gave my life to Christ was I feared that I would lose all my friends. And this sounds amazing, but of the 13 people who were closest to me, within one year, 11 of them came to Christ. Just want you to know that God is still in the business of dramatic conversions. Uh, Paul was killed by Nero in Rome, but God is still alive, and he's still converting people dramatically. Don't ever, ever, ever doubt that.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.